I'm Relationship Rhett, social media's premier relationship expert, and I'm here to answer all your relationship questions. Craig asks, my neighbor is a big Duke fan and he is obnoxious during basketball season. Is there any way I can get along with him better? Absolutely, Craig. The first step is to let them know you don't agree with him in an obvious way. Get in heated arguments about it with them. Replace their bumper stickers with one of your own. If they put up a flag, you put up an even bigger flag. If they don't get that your way is the only way, start to avoid them and ignore them in public spaces. And remember, if someone is different than you, shun them. Until next time. Well, go ahead and open up your Bibles and turn them to the book of Romans chapter two. And you can just kind of hold your finger there. We're going to get there eventually. You're not going to think we are, but we definitely will. As we continue our series of talks on the topic of relationships. But first, I want to start off uh, with a story. It's a story I actually told last year during our counterculture series. But um, a lot of you are brand new uh, because we're growing like crazy. And I'm 37 and don't have that many cool stories. So it was 2016 and uh, we were about a year into uh, planting a church, starting a church in Asheville. And I got invited uh, to this uh, a fundraiser event for a nonprofit legal service. And they would hand out free legal advice and services for people who were in need, but couldn't afford it. And uh, it was held at this brewery downtown, which everything in Asheville is. And uh, I didn't really know what it was about. I didn't know the people that were going to be there. I knew what kind of beer I wanted. That's about it. So um, there was about an hour that we were supposed to get some food and sit down and mingle with some different people and until um, the leaders of that nonprofit got up and gave their speeches and really asked for money. So I got some food and I sat down with these two older gentlemen and uh, we talked about the legal service. We talked about the city for a while. And then eventually the topic came like, what, what, what do you guys do for a living? And one of them was a local owner of a business. Uh, the other guy was a lawyer himself. And then they asked me, hey, what do you do? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. Uh, we moved into the city about a year ago and we started a church kind of like right up, right up the street. And this look came across their faces and there, one of the guys said, don't you think Asheville has too many churches already? And they kind of chuckled and stuff. And I was like, that's not the response I thought I would get. And then the other guy said, well, what kind of church is it? And I said, well, it's a Christian church. He's like, I know, but is it like universal, unitarian? Wait, is it like evangelical? And I said, yeah, it's an evangelical church. And they looked at each other and they looked back at me and they grabbed their plates and they stood up and they walked to a different table across the room. And I was like, oh, wow, I did not expect that to happen. Like they, they heard that I was an evangelical pastor and because of that, they got up and they left. They basically rejected me. And uh, that's the first time I had experienced that in my adult life. Like I've, I've asked girls out and they've said, no, believe it or not, I know hard to believe. I, I remember letting some dance moves that were a little too much for some people on the dance floor in sixth grade and people running the other way. But these are like, these are like grown men. And uh, there's a term for what I experienced. It's called rejection. And it didn't feel good to be on the receiving end of it. And uh, if I had to guess, there's a lot of people listening right now or in the room right now that have been on the receiving end of rejection. Everybody experienced that, been pushed away, been sidelined. You could admit it, it's a safe place. It doesn't feel good. It's, it's one of the worst feelings in the world you can have. And one of the tragedies that I think, one of the most tragic things that I, that I hear often is that there are many, many people that have experienced rejection, that have been on the receiving end of that horrible experience from people that would proclaim to be Christ followers um, for all kinds of reasons, because they're, they're atheists or they're gay or they're transgender or they're the wrong race or the wrong class or the wrong political party or they come from the wrong um, side of the tracks. And, and because they've experienced rejection at the hands of people that proclaim to be Christ followers, now when it comes to God or religion and church, there's just a big no. They've just built this wall against that. And if that's you, I just want to say up front that I'm so sorry you experienced that. And uh, we're honored that you would give church and Jesus another shot. But rejection feels absolutely horrible. <laughs> you want to ruin a relationship? 
uh, reject people, push them away, make them check off this list before you'll offer them um, acceptance, which is the opposite. See, all of us know how horrible rejection feels, but we also know how amazing and joyful and happy it is to, to be treated the opposite, to be accepted. While we avoid rejection at all costs, and we flock to acceptance. Acceptance is like a magnet that just draws people in. Uh, like most of us, think about your friends right now. Think about the friends that you have in your life. Uh, most of us didn't intentionally choose those friendships. None of us walked into class or walked into a dorm room or to a job and to an office and said, I'm going to intentionally befriend the next seven people I come across. No, we just kind of gravitated to where we felt accepted, where we felt included and valued. And those are the people that we became friends with. And if there's one person that understood the destructive power of rejection and the redeeming power of acceptance, it was Jesus. It was Jesus. Jesus never rejected anyone. <laughs> you can read every single story about him in all four gospels and every single time you see him interacting, you're gonna, be see, you're gonna see him accepting and drawing people close. There was this one time um, he was traveling and instead of going around this area called Samaria, which is what good Jews would because Samaritans, they considered half breeds. They were half Jewish and half Roman and they worshiped God a little bit differently. But instead Jesus said, no, I, I kind of wanna go in there, through there. And so he sits at this well and this woman comes up, but it's no ordinary woman, Samaritan woman, but she's a serial adulteress. And so it's this half breed, not worshiping God correctly, wrong race, and uh, she's a habitual sinner. And does Jesus call her out? Does Jesus push her away? No, he begins a conversation with her. And with his demeanor and with his words, he draws her close instead of pushing her away. And because of that one conversation, her entire life changes. In fact, church tradition says she's our very first missionary to Samaria, that when the disciples go out, she's already been evangelizing. Or this one time he was uh, going through this town called Jericho, and there's this guy named Zacchaeus. You guys know the story? And Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was the worst of the worst. He was a liar. He was a cheat. He was a traitor. He was hated by everyone. And yet when Jesus sees him up in that tree, he doesn't call him out. He doesn't politely ignore him, which is what most Jewish people would have done to him. Instead, he says, hey, Zacchaeus, let's do dinner. Can we do it at your place? And Zacchaeus is like, okay, cool. And during that dinner conversation, Zacchaeus' life absolutely did a 180 degree. He, he promised and vowed to give all the money back and his life just went in a completely different direction. And we could go on and on and on of all these interactions where people, uh, where Jesus didn't push people away, but he drew them close he invited them and he accepted them and their life changed as a result. And that life change, that life transformation, that's why Jesus offered this radical acceptance. He, he wasn't willing to reject anyone because uh, he, he wanted to be a change agent. He wanted to eventually have influence in these people's lives. It's because he loved them and so wanted them to experience the freedom and the joy that he had on offer that's why he refused to reject any person he came across. But here's what Jesus knew that all of us need to understand. You will never have influence in a person's life until they first feel accepted by you. And if you've been around hope for five or 10 years, you've heard that sentence often. It's because we say it often because we believe it, believe the Bible teaches it, but you will never have influence in a person's life until they first feel accepted by you. That's what Jesus understood. And it's here at the topic of acceptance that for us Christians, it gets really, really confusing. And it starts to get really, really messy. And it starts to get really, really foggy. And so let me just give some disclaimers up front. First, uh, as I talk about acceptance today, uh, I am not saying that you should be willing to draw someone close who has harmed you or abused you or assaulted you or hurt you deeply. I'm not saying that at all. There are boundaries that we need to put in place, sometimes legal boundaries, sometimes relational boundaries. There, there, there are uh, proper times when we need to remove someone from our life. We're actually gonna touch on that in week four. So I'm not talking about that. Secondly, we talk about this topic acceptance often, probably about once a year. And um, it is this week of the year that I get the most concerned emails. <laughs> um, and the reason is, is because we're gonna talk about sin and we're gonna talk about acceptance as well. And so when I talk about sin, I might say 
or call something a sin that our culture does not believe is a sin. Maybe you don't think it's a sin and there's gonna be something that, that just makes you a little bit uncomfortable, maybe offended, and maybe even you have this desire to get up and walk out of the service, maybe log off online or walk out of one of our campuses. I'm gonna ask that you don't. Just hang with me so you can hear my heart, really God's heart. Um, and, and I'm also going to talk about radical acceptance of anyone and everyone and other people are going to take offense to that. And, and again, I would ask you just to stay seated, hear me out, just wait until the end. In fact, I think all of us are going to be uncomfortable today at some point. But it's so important that we talk about this and revisit this because it's going to get uncomfortable. Um, I've sat with numerous parents who come to my office or talk to me after a service and say, hey, you know, my, my middle school or high school or adult child has just come out as gay or more often now as transgender. And like that, that's my child. <laughs> and I know what the Bible says, but I'm hearing what they say. And this is what culture says. And I, what do I do? <laughs> um, or in, in my life, I've had close relationships with people with addiction and I'm not equating the two. Um, but, you know, being friends with an addict, it's hard because it's broken promise after broken promise after broken promise and I'm going to bail you out and yeah, let's have another lunch, let's have another coffee and you're just going to say the same thing. I don't have a problem, I'll get help when I need um, and I don't know if I can believe you anymore and there just comes a point where it's like, is it, is it worth having another coffee? <laughs> like if I just keep doing this, are you just going to keep going on this path? And there's tons of different circumstances where where you just get to a point where you're asking, should I draw near or should I push away? Should I accept even if they continue in something the Bible says is harmful to them? Or should I push away just a little in hopes that they'll come to their senses? This is some of the hardest situations to be in. Maybe you don't even have a close relationship with someone like that. Maybe there's a roommate or there's someone in a class or there's someone in your dorm or there's someone in your office or neighborhood that just has a very different worldview than you, a completely different worldview. And every time you're together, it's a little bit awkward and you don't know how to, how to navigate that. These are really hard situations. And then they're especially hard if you want to be faithful because it seems a little unclear what faithfulness looks like. So how do we handle this? Well, Paul experienced this a lot, surprisingly. Um, the, the, the churches that he started and that he wrote letters to, which make up a lot of the New Testament, were made up of two main groups, the Jewish people and the Gentile people. We talked about this last week. And uh, his duty, his call, was to use his influence, um, to, to influence both of these groups to become more like Jesus. And if you don't know what the term Gentile means, it just means non jews So these were Romans um, that had recently been converted and they had come into the church. And the Romans, I don't know if you know this, but they were, they're pretty loose morally speaking. Uh, visiting prostitutes was a normal part of life. In fact, it was encouraged and required if you wanted to worship certain gods or goddesses. Um, homosexuality, at least among men, it was just a normal part of the culture. Um, drunkenness, partying, this was all a part of their background. And so when they became Christ followers and they walked into a church, that's what they brought with them. And they're like, Paul, what do you mean we can't do this anymore, right? If you want to read a really good letter written to them, it's the book of 1 Corinthians. It's wild. Um, the Jews, on the other hand, they were extremely conservative. And they uh, prided themselves on following all of God's rules and all of God's laws and regulations. And they looked down on the Gentiles. In fact, they wanted to separate themselves from um, these evil Gentiles a lot. If you want to read a letter to them, it's the letter of Galatians. And so when it came to this whole accepting people for the purpose of influencing, Paul felt the tension that many of us feel. And I think that word tension is the perfect word. Here's what I mean. Some people hear that word acceptance and they view it as this extreme. Like, wait, accept anyone and everyone, no matter what they think or believe or how they behave or how they go about life or their lifestyle. That's a little extreme. I don't know if Jesus wants us to do that. Then there's another group that believes acceptance. It's not an extreme. It's like the bare minimum. Like, to be a decent human being is just to live and let live. You just got to accept people no matter who they are. But what Jesus really embodied and what I think the Bible really teaches is that acceptance isn't this extreme and it's not the bare minimum. It's really this, this messy, tension-filled point in between two others. 
And the two others, we're gonna put them up on the screen, but on this side, you have approve or approval. And on the other side, you have require, requirements. And, and in order to stay in the middle, in order to be faithful and to stay in this, this messy middle of tension of acceptance, which is what I believe um, Jesus wants us to do. And hopefully um, I'll prove that to you by the end. It's going to require us constantly battling against and pulling against forces that want to pull us either to this side or to this side. So there are definitely forces that want us to go to this side of approval. And we feel that in the culture all the time. But what you need to know is that accepting someone or being willing to draw someone close, no matter who they are or where they are on their spiritual journey, is very, very different than approving of them. So if you want to write down notes, acceptance does not equal approval. Now the people over here will try to tell you that hey, you're just going to approve of it. If you, acceptance equals approval, but it, it doesn't. They're entirely different things. And it's so hard because, man, the Bible says this, there is such a thing called sin and it broke God, God's good creation. And we have seen the effects of it for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. It just destroys and it harms every single thing that it comes into contact with. And God hates it so much because it harms the sons and daughters is the people here on earth that he loves. And so he was willing to pay an incredible price, the price of his own son, where Jesus came down into this broken world. He lived the life that we couldn't live, died the death that we should have died so that one, we could be forgiven of the sins that we've personally done, but also so that we could be freed from the destructive power of sin. Man, this stuff caused the death of Jesus. It's bad stuff. But see, we live in a culture that doesn't want to hear that. We live in a culture that wants to decide for itself what is good and what is bad. Don't give us an objective moral standard. No, no, no. This is good today. It might be bad tomorrow. I don't know. But you got to fall in line with what we say is good and what we say is bad. And so as Christ followers, we have to constantly fight against that pull, against that pressure to call something good that God clearly says is bad. And you might be saying, well, who in the heck are you to decide what's good or bad? <laughs> who gave you the moral authority to decide? And in response, I'd say I would 100% agree with you. I don't, I'm no one. <laughs> I do not have the moral wisdom to decide what's good and what's bad. That's why we rely on God's word. That's why we rely on what God has told us is good and what is sin. And that's what we do at Hope, just so you know. Everything that God, everything, everything that God calls bad or harmful or says does not lead to human flourishing, we're going to call bad and encourage people to step away from. And everything, everything that God says is good and leads to human flourishing and is glorifying to him, we're going to call people into. But see, we, we can never get to a place where we approve of something that God calls sin. That just wouldn't be loving. And Jesus warns us about giving into this pressure. Matthew 18, 6, it's intense. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it'd be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Like that, that's intense. So we have to fight that pull towards approval, but let's be honest, it's, it's not really approval anymore, is it? It's celebration, it's praise, and we certainly can't go there. So we have to fight that tension, but I don't want to linger there too long because I don't think that's where most Christians are pulled stray. Now there are some, there are some, absolutely, but for most Christians, it's the other side that causes us the most loss of influence. And it's the side that really gets talked about. It's, it's this pull towards require or requirements. It says, yeah, God wants us to accept people, but only if X, Y, and Z. Or yeah, I'm willing to accept someone if they don't do this or if they do this or if they stop doing that. I, I'm willing to accept you if you stop being gay or if you stop breaking promises or if you stop being lazy and irresponsible. But until then, no, nah, relationship's off. Until these requirements are met, I won't accept you. And if you're in one of these relationships, you're going to feel that pressure, especially if you're a part of a church, especially if you have Christian friends. There's going to be this pull in religious circles. And Jesus fought against this pull all the time. 
when Jesus welcomed Zacchaeus, the very next verse says, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. When Jesus allowed a prostitute whose life was changed because of him, she just walked in and broke down at his feet and like anointed his feet with perfume. It's beautiful. It's Luke 7. You can read it. But a Pharisee was, was the host of this party. And Luke 7 says, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Over and over again, people tried to pull Jesus over into this requirement. Accept, acceptance with limits, right? Sure, you can accept religious people. Sure, you can accept righteous people. Sure, you can accept uh, 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 Pharisees and people that have it all together, but certainly not sinners. And Jesus fought against this pull all the time. And you know what happened? It ticked religious people off. And just so you know, if you fight against that pull to requirements, that's going to be the response you get from some very religious people in your life. It's going to shock them. It's going to anger them. It's going to tick them off. I'm going to receive some concerned emails tomorrow from this group of people. See? But Jesus even told parables about this. Remember, the point of acceptance is not to approve. It's to influence. Jesus told this parable and he basically said, what kind of a doctor would I be if I kicked patients out of my office the moment I heard that they were sick? Like, that's the point. I have not come to cure the healthy. I've come to cure the sick. I haven't come to seek and save the righteous. I've come to seek and save the lost. You see, in Paul, he fought against this too. I told you we'd get there, Romans chapter two. And um, in Romans, he's writing to a Jewish audience. And the Jewish people have been writing him letters basically saying, hey, there's all these Gentile people that are coming into our church and they're rough around the edges, okay? They're, they're bad, their cheese is falling off the cracker. Like it's, it's rough, they, prostitution, they got drinking, all this sort of stuff. And so we need like a list of rules. There needs to be some regulations. Like you gotta do this before you come in. Like surely they have to clean themselves up before we welcome them into fellowship. And Paul writes a lot of the book of Romans to destroy that argument. And look at what he says. He's, he talks about, yeah, there's, there's evil people in the world. Romans 1. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. Sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, um, and gossip. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. And students, write this down. And they disobey their parents. Uh, they refuse to understand they break their promises, are heartless, have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. Okay, so Paul says, okay, this is the worst of the worst. It's a bad group of people. How are we as Christ followers supposed to respond to them? We'll read the very next verse. You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. They've never read the Bible, but you have. They don't know God's commands, but you do. When you say they're wicked and should be punished, you're condemning yourself for you who judge others do the very same things. You tell others do not steal, but do you steal? You say it's wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You lift up this, this very small subset of sexual sin and say nothing about pornography or adultery, right? You condemn idolatry, but do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You're so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. He says, you're looking down on these people as evil, but guess what? You're right there with them. And that's what we taught on the week before Christmas. Remember that John the Baptist talk? I don't know, half of you are here. Um, but you, the world is not divided into a good group of people and a bad group of people. There's no such thing as good and bad. Every single person is created in God's image, has the capacity for good, but that image has been broken and we're all sick. We're all infected with this disease called sin. So there's not a good group and a bad group. No, no, no. There's a group of bad people that have reached out for God's free forgiveness. And there's a group of bad people that haven't yet. But everyone is level at the foot of the cross. So give up this idea that sin is this sickness that you can catch by proximity, like a wake up call, we're all sick and we all need a doctor. Romans three, all people, whether Jews or Gentiles are under the power of sin. And then Paul lays out the fact that even though we're all equal, oh, that big list of sins, that's all of us. Did God give you any requirements before he accepted you? No, not a one. 
Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law, it's based on faith. So we're made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. Then he uses Abraham. Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that's not God's way. And he continues this argument for a few chapters, basically saying there's absolutely no requirements that God has for him to open his arms and begin to welcome you in. There is a requirement for forgiveness. That's faith. That's confessing, I'm a sinner, I need a savior. I believe that Jesus is my Lord and savior. That's the requirement for salvation. But for acceptance, there's none. Like, think back to the season that led you to become a Christ follower if you are a Christ follower. For some, that might have been one tent revival meeting. I don't know, Sunday night at a Baptist church, who knows. For some, it might have been a, a, a few months, maybe a few years. But during that whole process, God's hands were wide open, weren't they? It might have been conversation after conversation after conversation with this one person that kind of got you started about thinking about Jesus where God was drawing you near and drawing you near. And maybe it was experience after experience after experience where you're like, there's got to be a God because this is too weird. Or maybe, maybe it's true, you did just walk into a church service and walk out a Christ follower, but even then, there was an hour-long process where God's spirit was in your heart and bringing up truth after truth after truth and bringing up conviction after conviction. And during that process of him drawing you near, drawing you near in the hopes that you would reach out for salvation, did he put any obligation or requirements on you whatsoever? Absolutely not. In fact, it was that it was that, it, that free, unmerited acceptance that, that created this environment where you could finally feel the courage to cry out, yeah, I am a sinner, and I just need to fall on your salvation. That's, that's what Romans 2 says. Don't you see how wonderfully kind and tolerant and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? It's your kindness, Lord, that leads me to repentance. And Paul says, as his followers, that's the same way we should treat each other. Romans 15, 7. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. He says, therefore, stay in the tension-filled, messy middle and fight against the pull towards approval or towards, towards requirement. And if you do that, as awkward as it might be, who knows? God might get glory. It's that kind of acceptance that wrecked your life and changed it. Maybe God can use that in the life of someone else. And these things are so complicated. Um, and I wish that I could give you a list of principles or just a list of rules and regulations that you can apply in any single one of these relationships to make sure that you just knock it out of the park and do the right thing, but, but I can't give that to you. Um, but one thing that I, I can do is I can take you back to a parable that I go back to whenever... I'm in one of these relationships where I'm counseling someone and it's Jesus's most famous parable. And you might not know this, but it's actually written to this, with this topic in mind. It's, it's the story of the prodigal son. Um, it starts in Luke 15. Notice the, the context. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. And this, this nearness of sinners made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. They were ticked off that he wasn't pulled into this requirement side. And so Jesus tells this series of parables. The first is the parable of the lost sheep. And he's like, oh, the reason I'm hanging out with them is because I love them. Like you have one lost sheep, you'll leave the 99 to go chase after that. And there's the parable of the lost coin. And even though the, the main character, she has nine coins, she turns the house over just to find that one because it's so precious to her. And then he tells the story of two sons. And I'm going to kind of modernize it a little bit. But there was an older one and there was a younger one. And the younger one basically says, hey, when you die, dad, I'm going to get an inheritance. And uh, I don't really want to hang out with you that long. So can you just give me my cut now? And the father says, okay. And so the younger son takes that. And he flies to Vegas. I don't know. And he spends all of his money on the slot machines. He spends all of it at the buffets. He spends it on prostitutes. He spends it on drugs. He spends it on drinking. And after a year, year and a half, he wakes up in like the gutter of Las Vegas and realizes I'm out of cash. 
and I'm out of food. And a few days later, he's eating food out of the dumpster in the back of some casino. And, and he kind of hits rock bottom. And the Bible says he came to his senses. And he says, you know what? My, my father has some workers, employees that are eating way better than this. Maybe I can go back home and he'll allow me to just be a hired servant. And so he makes up this huge speech. And it says this in Luke chapter 15, verse 20. So he returned home to his father. <laughs> and notice that he still thought of it as home. The father never cautioned him about sin, never pleaded with him not to run down this road. You don't have to convince people of the dangers of sin. Sin will do that on its own. But if you just maintain this accepting open heart, maybe one day when they hit rock bottom, you're the place that they're gonna go. He says, so he returned home to his father and while he was still a long way off, hadn't said, forgive me, hadn't apologized, the father saw him coming and filled with love and compassion. That's the heart of the father. He ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. And his son starts this speech, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But he can't finish it because his father cuts him off and says, quick, bring the finest robe in the house, put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for the son of mine was dead and he's now been returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. And so the party began. Listen, the father's been practicing his welcome home speech long before you ever started practicing your forgive me speech. But see, the purpose of this parable is to contrast the father's heart with the heart of the older brother. It says this, meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working and he heard about all this stuff that was happening. Skip down to verse 28. And the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. But his father came out and begged him, but he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. And his father said to him, look, dear son, you've always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he's found. I don't know what you should do in these confusing situations, but I'll tell you this. If you do your best to display to them the heart of compassion and love and acceptance that their heavenly father has for them, God's gonna use it. God's gonna, let that be your guide. And we as a church, man, we have got to do this. There's thousands, millions of people out there when they think of Jesus, when they think of God, when they think of religion, they just think of rejection. They think of judgment, they think of pride, they think of pain. And so we as a church, we have got, the world needs us to step up, to not be pulled to approval, but to stay as far away from requiring as we can and to just open our arms and show them the heart of acceptance of our heavenly father. And before we leave, maybe that was you. Maybe you walked in here or are listening right now and that's what you thought church was. It's all about rejection. Maybe you're here to try to clean yourself up so that God maybe will help you out. And you heard that you don't have to do that. I think it'd be foolish of me to dismiss us without at least giving some people a chance to start a relationship with that heavenly father. So if we could bow our heads and close our eyes across all of our campuses and online. If that's you, maybe you're the younger son or daughter you've gone way into sin, maybe you're the older son and you've been trying to be good for the past few years and thought you were, but kind of realized today, no, 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 I still need a savior. All you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. Just pray something like this, Father, I'm a sinner, I need help, but I wanna be accepted into your family and I heard that you will do that because of Jesus. So would you forgive me? Would you transform me? And it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. If you made that decision, tell someone. But Father, would you all help us have your heart as we go out into the world? That's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. What an incredibly challenging message and what an incredibly freeing message. Uh, so good and so grateful for Chase and for what the Lord is doing 
in and through our church. Uh, well, look, thank you so much for being here. You should see a button on your screen somewhere. If you click on that button, you click subscribe or you hit like there, that will just subscribe you to our YouTube channel. Anytime we have new content or messages come out, uh, you, then you'll get some updates and notifications that way. One last thing before you log off, I want to let you know uh, that the generosity of our church in, in accepting and seeking out to reach the triangle and change the world has impacted not just the triangle, but also Port-au-Prince, Haiti. We talk a lot about our Global Hope partners in Nicaragua or even in the Lighthouse in Emerald Isle. But look, we have a partner in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, who this last weekend, they celebrated their ninth anniversary as being Agape Church. And with that, they fed 3,500 people a meal after service. And let me tell you something about the generosity of the people of Hope Community Church. You provided that meal. Now, you weren't in the kitchen. You didn't cook it anything, but you provided that meal for 3,500 people. And that is one thing that we are proud of at Hope Community Church, the generosity of us. Uh, we absolutely love that we have the ability to reach, yes, the triangle and change the world. So let's keep being that church. We love you guys. We'll see you again next week.